against. And so let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1. Would to God that you would bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, <clears throat> for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent <clears throat> beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, <clears throat> you might well bear with him. We live in a day of deception, don't we? And the deception is great. It's not so great that the children of God can't discern it if, as they walk in the light as he is in the light because the light exposes all things, right? <clears throat> things of darkness can't be hid when the light shines upon it. It becomes seen. I want to remind you again of 2 Corinthians 11, <clears throat> Paul's concern, verse 13, that there were false apostles deceitful workers. They were workers of deceit transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, <clears throat> for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness whose ends shall be according to their works. Now, you'll notice here that these ministers that are ministering, evidently among the churches of God, <clears throat> are ministers who are laboring, verse 13, deceit. They're deceptive. Uh, do they use a Bible? The answer to that would be <clears throat> yes. Do they talk about Jesus, as it were? The answer to that would be yes. Do they speak of the Holy Spirit? Well, the answer to that would be Yes. Do they talk of gospel? And the answer to that would be yes. But it's not a. It's a contrary gospel. It's a contrary spirit. It's a contrary Jesus. Or we could word it this way: It's different. It's different from our New Testament. You'll notice that their end, verse fifteen of Second Corinthians eleven, their end shall be according to their works, and their works, verse thirteen, are works of deceit. And in some cases, they themselves believe those things. Some cases, they're doing it willfully, volitionally. In other cases, they've just been taught this, and they are unwitting. They themselves have been deceived, and they are deceiving others. But there is another type of transformation that goes on other than just in the pulpit, and that's in the pew. Now think about this. If Satan can be transformed into an angel of light, and if it is no great thing that his ministers should also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, then how difficult would it be for tares to be sown among God's people? What is a tear? Well, it is false, isn't it? And in its youth, it looks like weed, it, it acts like weed, it comes up like weed, and it's, it's rooted in the same soil as wheat, but eventually, by and by, it becomes evident that they're what? They're tares. And Jesus himself said, <clears throat> when they asked him, well, who did this? He said, an enemy have done this. And that enemy is who? The devil, the adversary of God. So I want to speak to you this morning on the third <clears throat> contrary gospel. I've entitled this the contrary gospel of nominalism. The word nominalism refers to a label only Christianity. If something is nominal, it's a nominal if you're if you get characterized as a nominal Christian, that's that's not a uh, you know that's not a badge of honor. They're saying that you're a person that doesn't possess genuine Christianity in your life, but you, you do claim the name of Christian. 
And when we think about that, <clears throat> and we think about a label only, or we could word it in the words of Paul, a word only, Christianity, when we think about that in, the, in our nation, how many in our nation today who are frequenting churches this morning, and even many nominal believers don't even go to church, how many of the self-confessed Christians in this country are genuine. And brethren, I just want to let you know right up front that in our dark days, and I think we all would agree that, that the oppressiveness of darkness is sweeping in among us, and even though that is evil and that causes us worries and concerns, it's not all bad. Why is that? Well, many of us and many previous generations have been praying for revival. This is God sifting his church. Where no longer could you sit in a genuine Bible-believing, Bible-practicing New Testament congregation and be there and label only, as it were, because the cost is too high. The Lord is answering prayer. He's only not sending revival as perhaps we think revival is, but he is sending life to his people and to the church, and he is sifting the church of Jesus Christ, and and he's going to sift it more in the days ahead unless something unusual happens upon the scene. The contrary gospels of Roman Catholicism we saw <clears throat> last week comprise some, and, and the prosperity gospel comprised some one third of the earth's populations. And again, there's some overlap in here, but if we add to that group nominalistic Christians, then how many of that comprises the population of the earth today? Nominalism Christian is what we export in many cases to overseas countries. It is a Christianity that is so doctrinalist it's almost non-existent. One writer wrote concerning this that for the past 150 years we've been in the process of seeing more and more people convert to less and less Christianity. That's an amazing statement, isn't it? We're trying to minimalize the doctrine so that we don't offend anybody and we get the maximum number of people, but the question is, is there any power in it? And one of the first things that gets taken out of the gospel presentation is the preaching of the cross. Paul says that in the book of 1 Corinthians. He says that in the book of Philippians. And so this morning I want to take a look at this, and then tonight I want to I want to talk about uh, some antidote to this and, and what we need to do in light of it. <clears throat> this is a Christianity, this nominalistic Christianity is a Christianity that uses God's promises for self. We're experts at this. Using the law to get our way. People do this every day in the courtrooms, don't they? They'll say, well, I'm going to sue somebody because the law says that I can do it. <clears throat> and, but the real motive is covetousness and gain, which is just as much against the law as any other law. We cover up the motive under, well, it's legal. We're experts at this using other people's promises, other people's words to get our way. We're experts at this. This is devilish. This is of of the grave and of hell. That goes on today, to use God's promises for self. You talk to people, you say, do you know the Lord? Are you saved? Are you born again? And they say yes, and you say, well, how do you know? And they say something along these lines. Well, You know, the Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I asked him to save me, so I'm I'm saved. Well, they act as if there's no other verses in Romans chapter 10. 
or in the other scriptures. That's using the promises of God for one's own self. This is a word only Christianity. And in fact, brethren, there are those out there that <clears throat> want to avoid hell. Who wants to go to hell, right? They want to avoid hell, but they don't want to be delivered from sin. They want to go to heaven enjoying sin. Is that contrary to the purposes of God in whom John writes in 1 John that the purpose of the gospel of Jesus Christ is to destroy the works of the devil? To destroy the works of the devil. That's the purpose of the gospel. Whether that work of the devil is outside in human nations or in the community or if it's inside our soul. And folks, you do realize that, that unless you want deliverance from sin, there is no hope for you. Some people think the gospel came, so, so uh, they believe that, that Jesus suffered and he died, but the whole purpose of that was so they don't have to. If there's no discipleship, I've heard preaching that says, well, you can be a believer but not a disciple. You can be a disciple and a believer, but there are two different categories, two different stages of Christian life. And, and brethren, anything that divides the saints like that is not of the Lord. This has permeated our churches today. We have accepted within our churches a naturalistic, moral type of life, but what we don't want is the love of the truth. This is exactly what the scripture says. Take your Bible. We're going to be turning to several passages here, but turn to 2 Thessalonians. Let's just go over there and, and see what, what Paul wrote to this church. <clears throat> He talks about the mystery of iniquity in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Verse 10, and with all deceivableness. You see that? It's deceptive. With all the deception of unrighteousness in them that perish because. Why are they perishing? Because they received not what? The love of the truth. Why is it today that you have to beg people to read the scripture, to want to hear truth, to incorporate the truth in their, in their lives? Why is this? Could it be there's no love of the truth? One of the marks of the life of God and the soul of man is, is the love of the truth. Look at what it says again. Let's read it again. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why are they perishing? Because they receive not the love of the truth. Why should they receive the love of the truth? So that they might be what? Tell me. Saved. Why is it that congregation members don't want Bible preaching? Why is it that we're so concerned that now we've reduced Bible preaching, so-called, down to just 10 minutes, 12 minutes, because, quote, people can't take anything longer than that. Why is that? They can sit on a couch and watch a football game for three hours, why can they do that? They love it. That's why. Why can they only take 12 minutes? Because they don't love it. Why is it that they don't pick up their Bibles during the weekday? Why is it that there's no concern about Christ? His word. 
Why is it that they won't confess truth? There's no love of the truth in their souls. Oh, but they'll sing, oh, how I love Jesus. They'll talk about grace and how God has saved them freely so they can go on in their own little ways and their own little world and their own little sins. And, and it's okay because when they die, they're going to go to heaven because they pray to prayer. Is this the gospel? Is this really why Jesus came to die on the cross? In Romans chapter 2, he talks about the Jews. And he talks about their characteristics. The Jews had an Old Testament Bible in their hands. Romans 2 and verse 17, he says, Behold, you're called a Jew. You rest in the law. You make your boast of God. All right, now let's think about that. In Romans chapter 2, is that Jew saved? Here's a Jew. Do they call themselves a Jew? Here's a so-called Christian. Do they call themselves a Christian? Do they have a Bible in their hands? Do they have God talk in their mouth? Verse 18, do they know His will? Do they approve the things that are more excellent? Have they been instructed out of the law? Are they confident in their Bible knowledge that they could actually give it to other people, that they are a light in darkness? Verse 20, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes. But what's the problem? Folks, what's the problem? What did Jesus tell Nicodemus? You must be what? Born again. There has to be a birth inside of you. And so he says in Romans chapter 2 and verse 20, you have a form of knowledge and of the truth and the law. And it is those people who put to death Christ. And in Romans chapter 10, the Bible says concerning these people who have a Bible, have an Old Testament, have the synagogues, have the services, have the temple, have the worship, have the commandments of God, able to instruct others, he says to them, you know what you're doing? You're using all these things to cover up your rebellion against God. That's deceival, deceiving, isn't it? And I wonder, I just wonder, brethren, this contrary gospel of nominalism, I just wonder how many are sitting in churches today and they are using their Bibles and they're using the commandments of God to cover up their utter rebelliousness against God. This hypocrisy, this play acting of confessing themselves Christian while they think and speak and walk like the world. It is a perverse Christianity that relishes and loves pleasures and self and material gain and money and perverts the New Testament gospel to suit their rebellion. They don't love the scripture. They don't love his church. They have no love of Christ in their hearts. And you know it's not there when you confront them with the plain statements of the scripture and they walk away. They use the Bible to cover a rebellious heart and there is no change of nature inside of them. And you know what, brethren, when you, <clears throat> when you change Christianity, or as the writer said, I quoted, you have more and more converts to less and less Christianity. When you twist Christianity like that, the only thing you have left is a label-only Christianity. That's all you have left. And Paul would write Timothy and say, these people deny 
they deny the power thereof. They deny it. They say it's not there. They say that in their minds. They hear a preacher get up. You've got to be born again. You've got to have the life of God in your soul. You've got to have the love of the truth. You have to have a change in nature. And they hear that and they say, well, I prayed a prayer and I don't believe what you're saying. They deny the power of the gospel. And Paul tells Timothy, from such, turn away. <coughs> This is a deception that instead of saving people leaves us in our sins while promising us heaven. And churches have transformed themselves <clears throat> into a place where people can have their Christianized pleasures and enjoy their Christianized self for Christianized gain. It's a tragedy. Paul himself would write to the Philippians, I'm writing this, and I'm weeping because they are enemies to the cross of Christ. Folks, this is a danger. <clears throat> And in fact, any thought <clears throat> and preaching that God has promised, he's vowed by his great and holy name to destroy the worldly loves of lust and self and money and boasting and pride only threatens their idea of Christianity. It's much easier to go somewhere that accommodates their categoried life. It's dangerous to them. And it is some of the greatest disturbers of the church of God today. And any pastor who loves Christ and loves the church, his body, and loves people and would have an overwhelming concern about that. Now, first of all, I want to show us in several places time would fail <clears throat> for us to be comprehensive in this, but just show several places where Jesus warned about this. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 7, which is at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> and he is talking here concerning the proliferation, the multiplication of false teachers and the deception of this day. Look at verse 13. <clears throat> he gives a command. This is his invitation, as it were, at the end of this sermon. He says to the great multitudes out there, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, <clears throat> and broad is the way, that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. How many? We don't know the number, right? But it was to this degree that at another time and event, one of the disciples asked Jesus, are there only a few that are going to be saved? And Jesus' answer to that question is, you yourself pursue the kingdom of God in His righteousness. Don't worry about the numbers. Worry about who? Yourself. Enter in at the straight gate, the narrow gate. <clears throat> Why should you enter in at the narrow gate? Because broad is the gate and spacious is the way that leads to destruction and many are going in thereat. Why are they going in the broad way? Verse 14. Because the gate is narrow. That's why. That's why they go the broad way. That's why they go the spacious way. That's why they go down the well-trodden path, as it were. The path of comfort and ease. But is the straight gate and the narrow way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. 
And the bad thing about this is, verse 15, is that there is going to be such a multiplication of false teachers and false prophets that are going to encourage people to go in the wide way. And that truly is the case today, isn't it? And folks, I think, <clears throat> I think if we really are at the latter end of the last days, and I, I think we are, it's only going to get worse. Jesus tells us, verse 15 of Matthew 7, what about false prophets? What is he telling us to do? Beware. <clears throat> There's a danger, right? Warning! The Savior is sending out a yellow caution. Warning! Beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. They are ministers of Satan, Paul writes. But inwardly, they're ravening wolves. How do you know them? You know them by their fruits, their works of deceit. Because a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. We have the idea today that, that you can be a bad person and have good fruit. I heard one preacher say <clears throat> one time that this is like, you know, buying a Christmas tree <clears throat> and taping ornaments on it and saying the tree's alive. Taping apples to an apple tree when you've cut it and placed it in your house. It's dead. But from far away, it looks like it has wood on it apples on it, but when you get up close and you examine it, you see that the fruit is taped. Jesus said, verse 21, <clears throat> Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now let's just pause there. Did he say that? Did he say that everyone who says they're a believer may not be. Are they confessing, Lord, Lord? Are they doing many wonderful works in His name? Are they preaching, testifying, confessing the name of Christ? Do they even do deceitful signs, casting out devils? What is Jesus going to say to them? Verse 23, Then I will profess to them, I never what? I never knew you. There was, there was no saving relationship there. They were not children of God. They were children of the devil. <clears throat> and the end result of those people, verse 23, is this. Depart from me. Because what are their works? <coughs> Iniquity. They're doing wonderful works in His name. They are preaching in His name. They are confessing His name. They are saying, Lord, Lord, upon their lips. But their works are works of what? Iniquity. Sin. never knew you. Both of these people hear the sayings of Jesus. Both of them build houses that look similar. Both of them are in the same similar locality. Both of them experience the rain, the suffering, the storms of life. They look, they, everything about this looks great, but the difference is the foundation. One person builds their life upon a rock. They hear the sayings of Christ and they do them in the power of the Spirit of Christ. The other person builds their house on the sand. 
And you know when you dig footers in a sand, the house goes up pretty quick. When you dig your footers in a rock, it's slower, isn't it? So let me ask you this. Did Jesus warn about this? In Matthew chapter 13, when he's talking about the nature of the kingdom, he says in chapter 13 of Matthew, verse 25, he says that we made reference to this, that the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field, and while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. And the servants of the household came and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How come it has tares? And he says, An enemy have done this. The servants say, would you, would you have us go and gather them up? And he says, no. That's what it seems today, isn't it? Seems like the Lord's not doing anything, right? He says, leave them alone until the right time. And the ones that are going to be able to make that type of discernment <clears throat> is the angels. Now let me ask you this, will the tares be judged? Will the church of God ultimately be have removed from them the tares? Will the world itself one day have the tares removed? The answer to that is absolutely. And the end of those tares, verse 30, <clears throat> is for them to be gathered in bundles to burn them. The end of the tares is everlasting destruction and flames of fire in a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. This is a danger, isn't it? It's a danger for our children. You know, parents, when your children are in your homes and they're young, Things look pretty nice because it doesn't cost the children anything to, be, to profess Christ. But one day they get shot from your house. And immediately what they are confronted with, especially if they go to a Christian school, immediately what they are confronted with is this. You don't have to be so zealous. You can be like us, living our own way, doing what we want, having a Christianity. It doesn't cost anything. It doesn't really save us, but we can have our material gain and we can have our nice, quote, clean fun. Don't be so hot for the Lord. And many a young person Many a young person has fallen for such a Christianity. Young people, let me tell you something. A Christianity that doesn't cost will take you places where you don't want to go. And you'll have to keep telling yourself over and over again. You'll have to keep denying the power thereof of the genuine gospel. You have to say, it's okay. I prayed. I've been in church. I was raised this way. I believe those things. And when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. But you know there's no power in your life. You know it. That's why you have to keep denying it. That's why... A per people can't sit without being distracted. There's no love for the truth, no desire for the things of God. The Holy Spirit warned of this nominalism. Not only did the Son of God warn it, the Holy Spirit warned it. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul writes, Now the Spirit speaks expressly. This is plain. This is revealed. This is clear. Then the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You want to hear what some of the doctrines of devils are? 
the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1, he talks about, Timothy, you need to go to the church of Ephesus because there's people there that desire to be teachers of the law, but they don't understand what they're saying. They carry the Old Testament in their hands. In chapter 4 and verse 3, they pervert and twist marriage and, and the purposes of God in marriage. Is that going on in our nation today? It's been going on for decades. Decades. The church has condoned a perversion of marriage. It deals with fastings. It deals with 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8, bodily exercise. It's amazing to me. Isn't it amazing that, that now we can have Christianized yoga? All in the church with contemporary rock gospel music. It's okay. God's interested in your body. Paul says bodily exercise profit it's just for a little while but, but godliness is profitable for eternity. They're throwing away the exercise of godliness for bodily exercise. In chapter 4 and verse 13 of 1 Timothy it says they don't regard the words of the Lord Jesus. They throw away the text. And Paul tells Timothy that the antidote to seducing spirits, deceitful spirits, and doctrines of devil is this. Give your attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Preach the word, Timothy. So what are they throwing away? The accurate exposition of the Bible for their own ways. That sounds like today, doesn't it? Paul would write concerning this nominalism in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1, his last epistle to that young son in the faith. And I like the fact he called him young because he was in his 40s probably. That this know also, Timothy, <clears throat> then the last days perilous times shall come. For men will be lovers of their own selves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are what? Good. They look down their nose at people that are good. They're false accusers. It's never my fault. Right? It's not my fault. It's your fault. It's other people's fault. It's not my fault. They boast in themselves. They love money. They love themselves. They love the lust of pleasures. They are lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And Paul tells Timothy... They have a form of godliness. That makes it deceptive, doesn't it? But they deny the power thereof. And Paul would tell Timothy, you know my life. You know what I preach. You know what I confess. You know how I lived. You know how the gospel lived out of my life. You know that, Timothy. Follow me. I think we forget that Paul wrote Timothy, the last epistle. He says to Timothy, the time is coming when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, how are they choosing churches? How are they choosing pastors? After their own what? Lust, their feelings. Well, how do you feel about that message? Well, I don't like it. It made me uncomfortable. You might need to be shook. You might need to be woke up out of your coma. 
because you've drunk the elixir of this. You're going to sleep. Paul would say, wake up to the Corinthians. They were going into a coma. After their own lust, they'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they'll turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. It's always interesting to me how evangelicalism, Christianity, and our nation goes through fads. About a year or so ago, they went through this fad, well, well, you know what, we don't need to preach the gospel, we just need to tell people stories. You know, the Bible's full of stories, so let's have story time. You know what? You have story time with children. It says something about us, doesn't it? They can't endure sound doctrine, but they're turned to fables. The apostles warned of this. Peter said in his second epistle of Peter that just like there were false prophets in the Old Testament, even so there will be false teachers among you who privily, they do this privately, secretively, bring in damnable heresies, even to the place of denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. There's people who build their Christianity by intruding into the offices of a pastor and a deacon who have selfish ambition and love of gain and love of immorality. It should not surprise you when you hear of false teachers all of a sudden finding out that they've been doing things in secret that should not be spoken of in the light. And then we create a doctrine that allows them. This is, this is atrocious. We allow them back into the pulpits after they have disqualified themselves from being in that office and may even have given manifestation that they're not even genuine believers themselves. You don't want to be unkind, do you? Yes! If Jesus says don't, we don't. Whether you think that's unkind or not, if they are disqualified, they don't need to be preaching to God's people. What do you think they're preaching to them? There's no surprise to me that when a pastor of a local New Testament church of whatever size is found to have been in immorality or builds his ministry upon covetousness and selfish ambition that when he is found out you'll find out that in the closets of the congregation members themselves they have the same sins the sins have been sown in their lives we have churches that are built this way We've lowered the office of a pastor to being a friend, not the voice of God. We've massaged the gospel into the fulfillment of one's own selfish ambitions of success. We draw people into our services by going after their own covetousness. We accommodate immorality in our churches today with no church discipline. And it started back with Churches accommodating dating and then accommodating divorce and then accommodating remarriage and now we're accommodating or seeking to accommodate homosexuality and how long is it going to be before we justify transvesticism? And now we have such foolishness as being promoted that the God of Islam is the same God as the God of Christianity. It is not. It's not even on the same scale. And yet at Wheaton College, the overwhelming majority of professors in that college supported the lady who made this foolish statement. Nobody saw anything weird about that. 
what they thought was weird was somebody standing up and saying, no, this isn't right. This nominalism has swept over us. And brethren, we ourselves and our families and our homes and our churches of Bible-believing, Bible-practicing churches are not immune to this. It's a constant threat. John would write, 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, Little children, it is the last time, and you have heard that Antichrist shall come, and even now, even now, there are many Antichrists. Do you hear what John said? Even now, 90 A.D., there were many Antichrists. What about 2016? John would write concerning a church that rejected the way of the cross. I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot, but because you're lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth, the Lord says. You think God likes this? You think he's pleased with this? It is nauseating to him. And the amazing thing about this is that Jude would write, you know, there's only how many chapters in the book of Jude? There's only one. And he would write this concerning Enoch. He would say this, that Enoch also, the seventh from Adam. That's a long time ago. Would prophesy about these false teachers today. He prophesied about today. What did he say? He said that these are people that of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, he says they're murmurs, complainers, walking after their own lust. And their mouths speak great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. That's what he said. And you know what he said Jesus is going to do with those? He's going to come with thousands of his angels and he's going to destroy them. We have a lustful Christianity today. We have a boasting of men Christianity today. And I've mentioned this already. Paul would write the Philippians, listen to this. Paul would say, he's admonishing the church. He says, many walk. Now hear what he says. Of whom I've told you often. What did Paul keep teaching them? that many walk, and now I tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, whose mind earthly things. We have an earthly thing Christianity. You preach and teach and say, you know, put your, set your mind on things above and And people sit in services and say, well, you don't understand the real world in which I live. As a believer, I understand the real world where you ought to be living. It's not here. You're a pilgrim here. Your homeland has fresher air. I understand where we ought to be living. You don't understand where you ought to be living. You want a Christianity without suffering. You want a Christianity based on human wisdom. You want a Christianity of wood, hay, and stubble. And you're fine with that as long as you get your way here in this life. But it's all going to fall down. At the end of the day, the enemies of Christ are going to bow their knee and Christ is going to say, these are the people that I honor. The ones that you despised.
response to all this and the world's turned away from truth, the church has minimized sound doctrine, we desired quick conversions, we, we think conversion is, you know, we, we, I had a situation here many years ago and I was out visiting in the community and I was having people say, oh, you know, a certain person was here from your church and you know, I've already done all this, and come to find out what this person was doing is he would knock on people's door and he would say, look, if you just prayed this prayer, if you just prayed the sinner's prayer, then you'd be saved. He'd say, now repeat after me. No teaching, no doctrine, no understanding, just, just repeat this prayer. And when I tried to explain what genuine gospel was, the door was shut. Folks, what we need is this, and I'm, I'm coming down. Here's the bottom line. Here's what's happened in the church today. We are looking for the gospel to change people's wills, not their nature. You might need to think about that just for a second. We're trying to persuade people by an act of their will to accept Christ. When we fail to realize that what the gospel has promised is not merely a change of will and the leaving of their sinful nature, it's a change of nature, who they are. And you know, whenever you tell people that, people are shocked, like Nicodemus. What do you mean I got to be born again? What? Are you a teacher? Are you a teacher? Are you a chief rabbi of Israel? You don't understand this? No, he didn't, did he? And so if we just come up with the right programs, if we just sell the gospel properly, if we just kind of maneuver people into a way in which they would pray a sinner's prayer, then everything's fine and everything's dandy. We change their will. And then we spend the rest of our life trying to change their will to get in church and to be faithful and to read their Bibles and to love God and to walk after Him. We have to give that person commandments. We have to force them to do things like you would a wolf. You know, a sheep follows. A wolf, you've got to make them. There's been no change of nature. I want to conclude by going to John chapter 1. <clears throat> I, just, I just want you to see this. John chapter 1 verse 12. <clears throat> but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were what? Born. Everybody see that? Which are born. How do you get to be a believer? Birth. Birth. Are you a believer because simply you prayed prayers? Are you a believer simply because you're believing your belief? You're a believer by birth, which were born. All right, how are you born? <clears throat> well, it's not a blood, is it? It's not because you were raised in church, your parents were good people. It's not a blood, nor the will of the flesh. You know, you can't do enough works to change who you really are. Right? I mean, you can, you know, you can put on a tie and a coat. You can, you know, have the Jesus talk. You can carry the right Bible, so-called. You can, you know, have friends, and they all say they're Christian, too. And you can go to the right places. 
That's not how you're born. You've got to be birth. You're not born by the will of the flesh. <clears throat> Look at verse 13. Nor of the what of man? Tell me. The will of man. Listen, brethren, <clears throat> you can't will this to happen. Everybody see that? You can't will this to happen. You can't say to yourself, okay, ah, nice, I woke up today, think I'll be born again. You can't will this to happen. You can't put God in a corner and make him do it. It's not of the will of who? Okay, whose will is it? Look at the text. Whose will is it? God's will. Everybody see that? This is God's will. And folks, <clears throat> if God is the only one that can do this, then you better go to him and cry out for mercy. Not go to him demanding, but go to him for mercy, right? Now, thank God he is willing to save all who come to him. Amen? He's willing to do that. And even in John chapter 3, let's go over there. In verse 7, when he tells Nicodemus, you know, marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Now look at this, verse 8. The wind blows where it wills. And you hear the sound thereof, but you can't tell where it comes and where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the what? Spirit. So how are we born? By the will of God. How are we born? By the will of the Spirit. Can you explain all that? No. But it comes by the will of God and the will of the Spirit through the Word of God. That's the sound of the Spirit. The sound of the Spirit is the voice of God. The words of God that you have in your Bible. And folks, we know that, don't we? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Folks, only you can't change your nature. Only God can change your nature. And when that change of nature happens, does a person call on the name of the Lord? Yes. When that change of nature happens, do they, do they voluntarily come to Christ? The answer to that is yes. But it all begins with the right foundation. Birth. Just like a child is in the womb, that that ovum that's there that, that is traveling is just waiting, just waiting for the seed. But that ovum is alive, right? But it's dead. The ovum is alive, but it's dead. What happens when that seed enters into that ovum? There is conception. So too, when the seed of the Word of God enters into you. Are you alive? The answer is yes. Are you dead? The answer is yes. What do you need? The word of God to cause conception. Birth. And you do that by having a faithful cry for mercy. Mercy. It is the one who beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, that Jesus said went down to his house, declared righteous by God. He was born again. When was the last time you, you heard somebody come to Christ with a cry? People come to Christ chewing gum and blowing bubbles and, you know, like, like is signing up some membership card. Folks, is there a danger of the prosperity gospel? The answer is absolutely. Is there a danger of Roman Catholicism? The answer is what? Absolutely. Disease that probably has effect 
us most of all is this nominalistic word only, label only, powerless form of a perverse Christianity that is so deceptive it threatens us. Beware. And may Christ do a work in your heart, in our children's lives, in our adult lives, in church members' lives. Do such a saving work in our life that we will love God more than pleasures. We'll love his word more than ourselves. We'll love the aroma and atmosphere of the things of heaven more than material gain. And we would actually show this by willing to lay down our life for the truth as it is in Christ Jesus.